Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining on our final interview of the Modern <laughs> Women's Health Summit. Um, I, this has just been an incredible experience getting to bring on all of these experts in nutrition and women's health and hearing about all different topics um, ranging from mind, body, weight, nutrition, preconception. I mean, we've covered really the whole gamut of um, information um, to help us be healthy in these crazy modern worlds that often does not make it very easy for us to be a healthy, happy person. So um, this video is live. Please comment, say hello to us. Let us know that you're here. We'll be able to see your comments as we're going through the interview. Um, so if you have any questions, um, stories to relate, go ahead and type them in and we'll be able to interact with you. Um, please also like this video, share it with your friends, and um, please uh, engage with us. It's always fun to see who's on here. All right, so today we are talking about supporting gut health for happy hormones. So I have Cynthia Thurlow joining me. Cynthia is a Western medicine trained nurse practitioner with 20 years of ER medicine and cardiology experience turned functional nutritionist with a niche in female hormonal health. Cynthia believes in the inherent power of nutrition to maximize health and wellness. And she lives in Washington, DC with her husband, two children and two doodles, which is so fun. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me, Cynthia. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And it, you know, I, I have to giggle. There, there's nothing like being the very last person to speak. I think that that's a good and a bad thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. This is a great one to end the summit on, though, because um, there's been a running theme throughout the entire summit. Like every interview has brought up digestion, mm -hmm. um, but really as a, a comment, you know, we've kind of been. Um, dipping our toes into the idea of the importance of digestion throughout the entire summit. But this is the first interview we're doing where we're actually going to get to dive into this topic. So I think it's actually the perfect um, ending interview for this whole summit. Oh, well, good. <laughs> um, so why don't you start us off and just tell us a little bit about how you came to the field of nutrition in the first place? Yeah, you would think with my background that I would never, I would never muddy the waters of Western medicine. You know, I think it's interesting. I have two children and my oldest, uh, when he was about four months old, developed terrible eczema and the Western medicine way of addressing that is just to give topical steroids, just creams. And, you know, after a few months, I thought, gosh, there has to be more to it than this. I mean, it's getting worse. It's not getting better. He's exclusively breastfed. Is it something I'm giving him unknowingly? And so um, that kind of started me down the path of really looking differently at food. Uh, we found out he had life-threatening food allergies, which was really mm. scary. You know, I felt like we needed to live in a bubble for a couple of years. I didn't want to go to restaurants. I was paranoid he might be exposed to tree nuts or peanuts. Certainly, we didn't have any of them in the house at that time. At that point in time, and so it just got me thinking that there was more to the food piece than what I had been trained in. And so initially, I became a wellness coach. Um, I got a certification. I didn't do much with that. And then I read a book, um, you know, it's called Eat the Yolks. And um, she is a very, very, yes, very famous um, NTP. And so I reached out to her and I said, I want to understand your training. Where did you go? What did you do? Um, and that kind of got me started, uh, you know, looking at the Nutritional Therapy Association. And I feel like that was one of those like life changing events, you know, starting that program three and a half years ago really changed things for me. Um, it, it made it a little harder to function in my Western medicine world because I started I to question a lot. I was very accustomed to writing prescriptions all the time. That's all I did. Uh, and when most people didn't want to engage in a conversation about changing their diet, but yet I knew that that could be one of the ways they could stop their, some of their medications or be on less medications. Um, and so that's, that's initially how I got interested. And then my own, own, my own health journey is what pivoted me to focus on female hormonal health. A, because um, my Western medicine colleagues do a great job of managing many things, but there are a lot of missing links that I think functional nutrition and functional medicine does a better job with. And mm -hmm. so in healing my body, I had to go through quite a bit. And so that kind of got me very focused on this is a much needed time in a woman's life where she needs more support. There are a lot of people who aren't. It's not sexy. No one wants to talk about perimenopause. No one wants to talk about, you know, women when they're 
done having kids or when they've chosen to stop having children. And so that was what kind of got me started in this in this niche. And it's a place I'm very happy to be in because I'm able to help a lot of people and work with a lot of really great colleagues that um, we, we make a lot of change in people's lives in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. That's a great niche to be in. And yeah, people people really need that support. And it's mm -hmm. when you're in a, uh, um, a niche that's not a sexy topic, yep. you know, it's not. It is yes. so not. I've been told that they're like, you know, you can sell, you know, a 20 year old dealing with painful cramps or yep. cycle problems. Um, but no one wants to talk about women when they're in this other space. And so I like to be a sounding board for this kind of forgotten time in women's lives when they're still mm -hmm. vital and necessary and all that. And anyway, so that that's how I kind of got into it. So I, I look at myself as a, I'm a beacon of hope for people who feel hopeless. So yes. Yes. Up. And when there aren't many people in that space, you are so, so needed to yeah. support those women. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to be talking about um, gut health and hormones. So let's just start off with uh, with gut health. Why is mm -hmm. this so important in general? Yeah. So the interesting thing is that we now recognize that gut health is really at the forefront of our entire bodily health. And so mm -hmm. when I talk to my clients about the need for optimizing or enhancing or improving their gut health, that leads to so many other things. They sleep better. They ha they're happier. They have less depression. They make better food choices. They aren't getting as sick as often. Um, and so to me, I really feel like it's the center of our health. And so, you know, the more focus and emphasis on how well we can digest our food and assimilate our food and process our food, the better off we are. There are just so many things about um, our digestive health that are not focused on. You know, we're, we're in a culture, as you mentioned, that is go, 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 go. Um, and so we can't actually digest food if we're in a stressed out state. And so how many women stand and eat their dinner while they're feeding their kids or eat yeah. food in their car or are distracted by electronics. So there's so many things that come down to proper digestion equating to, you know, good health or better health uh, or maximizing our health. So that's kind of, that's usually how I start the discussion with uh, clients, even friends and family. But for many people, it's the first time they've ever heard it. No one talks about this. You know, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, urban legend, like, is that really true? Uh, but definitely something that people, you know, need to understand. And the more they understand, the more you can empower them to take better care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So how does our gut health link to hormonal health? Because I think that's a, if mm -hmm. someone is um, wanting to watch this interview because they're focused on hormonal health, mm -hmm. this is probably brand new information that your gut has anything to do with your hormones. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of different ways that they're all intricately involved. I mean, I touched on some of them, you know, immunity. Mm -hmm. But we recognize, for example, we have to have a healthy gut to be able to convert inactive to active thyroid hormone. And the thyroid is uh, one of the most important endocrine um, organs. And mm -hmm. every single cell in our body is impacted by thyroid hormone. So if you have an unhealthy gut and you can't activate inactive to active thyroid hormone, you're going to be tired. You're going to be constipated. Your skin's going to be dry. You're going to gain weight. Gate weight gain is like the biggest pain point for everyone, every single person I see. Yeah. So just acknowledging that in order to properly package hormones, oftentimes our gut health needs to be healthy. We recognize that, you know, things like, and it's kind of a hot discussion right now, adrenal glands, mm -hmm. um, they manufacture a hormone called cortisol. If we are dealing with high cortisol and it impacts our blood sugar in a negative way, we are going to be craving the wrong foods. We're going to be um, negatively impacting the balance of the gut bacteria. Um, there are so many things and, and those poor choices will continue to feed these bad gut bacteria. So for me, there's multiple things and I'm happy to speak about any of them, but even our sleep hormones are impacted by our gut health. Mm. Um, you know, melatonin, which is secreted in our brain, if, if, our, if we're overstimulated by blue light that, you know, we get from our electronics, like I am, like we both are right now and everyone watching. Yeah. Um, if that impacts melatonin, it'll downregulate serotonin secretion, which is primarily neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. It impacts uh, cortisol secretion. So it's almost like if you think of the endocrine system, um, which are all these glands for hormones in the body, all of them are impacted by every single system. But I would argue almost largely, most importantly, by our gut and our brain health. So those two things can largely impact whether or not they're being properly secreted or um, not secreted at all and how that can impact 
you know, every single system in the body. Yeah. So um, you mentioned something that's probably brand new information for people watching, which is that our neurotransmitters mm -hmm. are actually produced in our gut. Yeah. That's mind blowing for a lot of people because we it assume is. the neurotransmitters are produced in your brain because that's where you're, you know, that's where we think we're using them. Right. Um, so that's that's incredible. Yeah. So it's anywhere from I've seen estimations from 70 to 85 percent of the bulk of our neurotransmitters wow. are produced in our gut. 15% in our brain. And we think about all these, these psychotropic drugs that are designed to work on neurotransmitters in our brain and how we don't talk about the interrelationship between diet and anxiety mm -hmm. and um, depression and all these, you know, these very common illnesses that we see. And I've seen um, profound changes by just doing basic elimination diets uh, for depression and anxiety. So we recognize that um, and I say we, those of us in the functional realm, recognize that there's a direct correlation with the food that we eat and, you know, food and mood is so important, but really there's actual scientific data that suggests that these relationships are not just something that are correlational, that there's actual fact about this. So um, when I'm working with clients and we're talking about food diaries and, and food choices that they're making, and I'm asking them to make the connection, when you had dairy, were, were your depressive symptoms worse? Yeah. When you had gluten, was your anxiety worse? Um, so those neurotransmitters really do play a huge role in how we perceive the world and how we interact with our loved ones and our friends and family. So a good point. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes something people have been completely unaware of until oh, yeah. um, they hear it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if we're getting back to hormonal health, what are mm -hmm. some of the hormonal imbalances that you see most often in mm -hmm. your practice? I know you touched on a couple. Yeah. So, so what I see most frequently um, right now, I'm seeing a lot of sex hormone imbalances. And by that, mm -hmm. you know, we have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, men and women make both. Um, it, testosterone is not unique to just men, but when those are imbalanced, I see a lot of what I call estrogen dominance, mm -hmm. which is very commonly seen because we have so many women on synthetic hormones. Um, the, uh, toxins we're exposed to in our food environment and personal care products can inversely impact these. So I would say that's probably the most common one. Um, I do see quite a bit of thyroid disorders. Um, and it's not just autoimmune thyroid issues like Hashimoto's or Graves. I'm seeing a lot of, um, low thyroid function related to heavy metals. Um, mm. sometimes it can be related to, um, you know, viruses that have been reactivated in their body. Um, you know, certainly that's a concern. And then, you know, you're seeing quite a bit of adrenal health issues. I know adrenal fatigue is really not the appropriate term. Uh, what I like to say is it's hypothalamus pituitary dysregulation, which is a big fancy way of saying our brains are in control of our entire endocrine system, all of those hormones, all of those glands. And if you're not nurturing your brain, you are at risk for all these hormonal imbalances. I do also see quite a bit of insulin resistance as well mm -hmm. as low blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia. Uh, and sometimes those two things can be impacted enormously just by changing what we're eating. So oh, yeah. I always say it, it's not as if um, you've been told you have insulin resistance and you just have to give up and say, I'm eventually going to develop diabetes. No, no, no. Almost all of these things we can work on very, you know, I don't want to use the term aggressively. We can work on these with food and supplements and targeted testing um, in a way that, you know, you may never need to be on um, prescription medication. So certainly those, those are the big ones um, that I typically see. But here's the other piece is that I look at sex hormones, thyroid and adrenal glands or adrenals as a three-legged stool. So if one is in balance, mm. we're all in balance. So if anyone thinks that thyroid issues exist in a vacuum, I'm here yep. to tell you you're wrong. Same thing with adrenals, same thing with sex hormones. And most people have a little bit of, of each of those. It's not, it, it's never that I just see one and not the rest. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember is mm -hmm. that they're all impacting each other that, you know, if you have a, um, an estrogen problem or a sex yeah. hormone problem, it's it's not like everything else is perfectly healthy. And that Correct. one thing is out of balance. They're all connected to each other. And something something else that you mentioned that I want to make sure people understood was you mentioned insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people forget that insulin is a is a hormone that your Correct. blood sugar regulation involves your hormonal mm -hmm. health which impacts all of your other hormones 
Absolutely. And I think people hear the word insulin and they think of it in the context of well, my grandma takes insulin yeah. because she's diabetic. Yeah. Um, yes. It's one of the hormones secreted by the um, pancreas um, in addition to a few other hormones, but it's one that's really important. And when you can no longer, when, when that, when you can no longer effectively use insulin to move um, excess sugar into the cells, um, that's when that becomes hugely detrimental. And we, as a society, it's interesting. We were just out of the country, my husband and I last month. It's amazing to see the disparity between the United States and other countries that we really mm -hmm. do have a big, big problem with blood sugar regulation. Um, and it's really sad. And, and, and because I worked in um, very sick areas of medicine, you know, cardiology, ear medicine, sometimes we see the worst of the worst. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how much, how much of an impression that really indelible impression that made on me that you want to be as proactive as possible. Even if you're 40, 45, 50, you can still make a huge impact on your health by making changes. Um, so don't let anyone that's listening think that, you know, because they're X age, I don't believe in limiting beliefs, but anyone that's listening, um, I just don't believe that, you know, that it's a lost cause at any age. Absolutely. And that's something that we hear in advertising mm -hmm. and the medical, even the medical community. I've heard doctors say this to people is it's just, just the normal part of getting older. It's nope. just, yeah. Nope. It's limiting just beliefs. Age. nope, nope, nope. nope. I'm, I'm the, the, the whole concept of limiting beliefs usually gets yeah. me all fired up. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what are some other misconceptions about hormonal health that you see in your practice? Uh, I think the big one is people think just because they eat well, that everything's going to fall into play. You know, when yeah. they say eat well, I mean, that's all very relative. Um, if you don't take care of your lifestyle mm -hmm. and by that, I mean, if you don't dial in on stress, if you don't sleep properly, if you don't limit your electronic time, if you don't limit your exposure to radiation, Wi-Fi, et cetera, if you don't turn off your Wi-Fi at night. Um, it's all the things that influence, or if we don't do something that brings us joy, um, you know, finding a hobby, you know, connecting with nature. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but it's all the things that people don't think about. They think because they eat well and they exercise that everything will be in place. I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, it's so much more than that. So it's all of the taking care of you, mind, body, and spirit that is so important. Um, that's a lot of the work. I, I work with a lot of type A women who have been yeah. going, going, going for years. Maybe they're doing CrossFit. I'm not picking on CrossFit. I'm just using it as an example. Um, they do CrossFit. They don't sleep enough. They're they're too carb restricted. They think carbs are the devil or they think carbs are terrible. Um, so they're not sleeping. They're doing excessive exercise. They're not fueling their bodies properly. And then they never slow down. I mean, their yeah. bodies can't exist at that pace forever. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see younger and younger women who have got endocrine problems and not just blood sugar problems. The people who have their, their hypothyroid, so their thyroid is, is off. Their adrenals are are not behaving properly. Their hair is falling out. Um, they can't relax. You know, it, it's one thing after another. And so it becomes so hugely problematic that I just think we need to do a better job educating people that there's no shame in going to bed earlier or skipping a workout or eating some squash or some sweet potato or um, you know, getting a massage. I mean, I feel like women sometimes have to apologize when they take care of themselves and whether it's acupuncture, Reiki, you know, getting a massage, getting your hair blown out, whatever it is that brings you joy, that makes you feel good. We have to prioritize those things over other stuff. Like I would much rather a client say to me, I'm going to spend X number of dollars a month taking care of me and feeling no guilt. And that could be as inexpensive as renting a movie or having yeah. a glass of wine or taking a hot bath, you know, it, it could be that simple. It doesn't have to be expensive, but investing in you. So that to me is the biggest issue I see. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is so much dogma now about different diets and nutrition plans mm -hmm. um, and what works for you may not work for me. And so this one size fits all mentality, I think is really damaging. Keto seems to be like the hot topic right now. It works very, very well for certain people. If you can't break down more protein and fat, you are not going to do well on keto. You're going to gain weight. Yeah. Um, and so I get those women who then feel badly about themselves. It, it could be any diet. Again, I'm not picking on keto. There's a place for it in, in many ways. Um, but I think it's that kind of limiting belief system of it has to be all or nothing uh, that can be hugely problematic. The other piece is, you know, whether it's digestive health, um, you know, recognizing you have to be in the right mindset, you have to be relaxed to digest your food, 
you really need to connect with nature. You really need to move your body. Um, mm-hmm. Those are the other missing pieces, you know, and it's, it's smart movement. Um, we now know that things like HIT and Tabata, which are intense exercise for brief periods of time are much better for you hormonally than doing a long sustained five mile run at the same pace. Um, we know that releases more cortisol when you do that, when you have this long, long sustained pace, yeah. um, we recognize that there's better fat loss potential. I'm kind of jumping off on another tangential comp- That's great, um, yeah. topic, but intermittent fasting is great for hormonal health. If your hormones are healthy, it's not great for everyone, mm. um, but just recognizing that um, you shouldn't need to work out 10 hours a week to be able to maintain whatever it is that you're trying to maintain. You need to work out smart. And you need to, you know, slow down more. And that's that's kind of what I've come to find works best for most people. Um, you know, the, the the weekend warriors that, you know, work 78 hours a week and then they're doing like 100 mile bike ride on Saturday and doing CrossFit on Sunday. And so they never slow down. They're the people that are getting injured and end up coming in and they're just a hot mess. So those would be the common misconceptions that I see. It's not a one size fits all philosophy and you definitely need to slow down. Absolutely. That's been another theme throughout the entire summit mm-hmm. was not feeling shame or guilt if mm-hmm. something that works for your friend doesn't work for you. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I, I struggle, you know, when I had my health crisis, you know, three years ago and suddenly uh, the most activity I could do was to walk mm-hmm. um, after being very physically active. And I kept saying, well, why is this taking so long? Being so impatient um, yeah. but recognizing that your body needs to heal. And sometimes we just have to, you know, I use the term surrender. Sometimes we just have to surrender the experience, recognizing that, um, there are times in our lives where we're not meant to be as, um, vigorous and rigorous yeah. and, you know, hopefully things will come back full circle for you. Absolutely. And it's okay to be in that phase where you're slowed down. Yes. For a so whole year I walked, that's all I did. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> So if someone watching is experiencing some hormonal issues, Mm. what signs can tip them off that they actually need to be looking at their gut health? Huh. Um, If they are feeling anxious and depressed, um, Mm. if they are having lots of food cravings and by this, and and it's interesting, I had this discussion in in my private group today. Someone Mm. was saying, well, how do I differentiate between concerning food cravings and just a craving? And I said, if it happens every once in a while, that to me is benign. If every day you get up in the morning, you're thinking about a particular food or something sweet or something salty, that is a sign that something is off. So I would say food cravings can be a sign that something is off. If your energy is off, if you just can't function, you're not sleeping well, um, you have no libido. That's another big thing. You're gaining weight. Um, These are all signs that something is off. And obviously, those are all very kind of ambiguous symptoms that people can experience but it warrants someone looking at it very methodically, very thoroughly, very comprehensively to make sure there's nothing more concerning going on. And then you can kind of do the work to look backwards and see what else it could be. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So what are some of the common digestive issues that you see in your practice that might be leading to imbalances elsewhere in the body? Low hydrochloric acid, which we know is something that's very common as people get older. And if that's the first site of protein breakdown in the body, um, that can be an issue or, you know, sometimes just being susceptible to infections they otherwise wouldn't be getting. So whether it's H. pylori or parasites, that's common. Um, I would say if people don't produce good quality bile or they've had their gallbladder taken out, that can Mm. make it very hard to digest fats. Um, that's one thing that you can see, or, you know, the other big one is people aren't, I mean, let's be honest, if you are not having a bowel movement every single day, something is off with your digestion. It is not normal to poop twice a week. Like I sometimes have to say to clients, like, this is nothing to be embarrassed about. It is as normal as saying that you, you blow your nose or you pass gas. I mean, there, there's no embarrassment about this. It's a normal physiologic process, but it also gives us clues as to what can be going on. Like, mm-hmm. is your gut bacteria so off that you have an infection and that's why you're not going? Or do you just not break down fat and that's, you know, you've got gallbladder issues or are you just eating a garbage standard American diet? And that's why you don't go because you don't eat any fibrous dense yeah. vegetables. Um, so I, those are probably the three most common things that I see. The other piece that I would say that's really significant and worth mentioning 
is that a lot of people, and I mentioned this earlier, they're so stressed, they don't digest their food. So they're never in a parasympathetic or relaxed state. So even though they're eating a meal, they're standing up, they're in their car, they're running around, they're arguing with their spouse, they're yelling at their kids, they're distracted by the TV, the iPad, iPhone, whatever it is, or they're working while they're eating, you're yeah. you're not going to set your body up to be able to digest food in, a, in an optimal way. So those four things are probably the things I see most frequently. In fact, I had a new client this morning and the two things we talked about was the fact that she's never relaxed when she eats. She has no hydrochloric acid or very little. Um, and then she isn't going to the bathroom every day. And I said, okay, this, you know, these are three things I can work with right up front. We can enact change right away that can make a huge impact on how you feel. Mm -hmm. um, and she was kind of fascinated. She was like, no one's ever talked to me about pooping before. I was like, oh, well, yeah. we're going to talk about pooping. So it's an important part. It is. It is. And I think people are so, especially women, women are like embarrassed to say the word and guys don't care. And I'm in a house of men, like everyone in my house, including all of our animals are all boys. So, um, you know, toilet humor is like potty humor is like a big topic of conversation. <laughs> but I think for a lot of my female friends, like they're so embarrassed to say the word defecation, poop, pooping. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's like, it's just very gauche. And I'm like, no, no, it's, it's very normal. And yeah. there should be no embarrassment at all. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I've seen it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's such an important part of your health. So um, as we're kind of in this line of digestive health, I'm mm -hmm. curious what your views are on probiotics. Do you think that everyone should be taking probiotics or does it depend on their symptoms? Do, is that something that you customize for each person? It's a great question. Um, and actually, I did an Instagram post on this today, okay. not about probiotics per se, but just about there's no one size fits all philosophy when it comes mm -hmm. to supplements. Um, I have evolved on this. I do not believe everyone needs a probiotic. I want to know what's going on in the gut first. And so I use very, very specific standard DNA based testing to look at the gut health. So only if someone needs it, do I think that they need to take a supplement probiotic. What I do love are probiotic rich foods. Um, mm -hmm. Unless there's a reason for them not to be taking this probiotic rich foods. I am a huge fan of starting with food first. So I do have favorite products. If you were to say, Cynthia, what's your favorite, you know, probiotic that's out there? I like Megaspore. I'm a big Megaspore person. Okay. I do have some other favorites like True Bifido is another one. Um, but I, I always start, I want to test. I want to know the information. This is, this is like very much my Western medicine mindset. I want to know the data before I apply it to my client. And I just find, you know, with the amount of SIBO that I'm starting to see in many of mm -hmm. my clients, I don't want to start. I don't want to start probiotics as a frontline. Um, if I'm concerned at all that there might be SIBO, probiotics might make things worse. So, mm. to answer your question, um, I, I think most people need probiotic-rich foods. I think it always depends on what symptoms they're experiencing. I think it depends on their gut health, and it depends on that DNA-based stool testing as to whether or not I recommend a supplement per se for that. Sure, that makes sense. Um, so if someone listening is wondering where they could even get some probiotic rich foods, do you want to just quickly list off for people where they could find that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, um, if you don't have a good farmer's market, I think my favorite brand of fermented vegetables, you know, like is wild brine and most good mm -hmm. grocery stores carry that wild by brand wild brine brand has sauerkraut. They some, it tastes like a dill pickle, some Nika Madras curry, um, there's one that is beet and pear and ginger, which is fabulous. So I like fermented vegetables kind of to start kimchi is another option. That's a Korean, um, fermented vegetable that has a very pungent smell because it has uh, fish sauce on it. Yes. Spicy too. Um, but then it's the more like run of the mill, like kombucha, but obviously being conscientious about sugar, um, looking at kefir, which is fermented milk or even yogurt. Wild brine olives are another good option. I find that most of my clients are open to trying kombucha. Fermented veggies may freak them out a little bit. Um, kefir sometimes freaks everybody out, but yogurt seems to be a more conventionally um, acquired kind of thing. And you want to look for organic. You want something that's low sugar. Yeah. Uh, if you don't tolerate dairy, there's coconut milk, dairy, coconut milk, non-dairy yogurts. Um, you'll even see some almond milk, but I haven't found an almond milk yogurt that tastes good. I think Kite Hill, everyone mm -hmm. talks about Kite Hill. Kite Hill to me tastes like paste. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not a fan of <laughs> that type of yogurt um, as, as a personal, like personal preference. Um, but those are some good ways. I think olives are pretty accessible for people, but it needs to be 
you know, it needs to be a brined olive. It needs to be an olive that isn't just like the canned black olives that we all yeah. stuck on our fingers when we were kids. Although those are <laughs> yummy. Those um, are that's, yeah, that's definitely not what I'm talking about. And you don't need a lot of them for them to be effective. Like I recently ran across a woman who was drinking four and five bottles of kombucha a day. And not surprisingly, she has a histamine intolerance. So a little bit goes a long way. I always say a yeah. couple tablespoons of sauerkraut is perfect. Um, you know, quarter cup to half a cup of kombucha is perfect. You don't need a lot for them to be very effective in my mm -hmm. opinion. So, yeah, I would agree. One of my favorite, um, fermented foods is fermented onions with some oh. eggs in the morning for breakfast. Oh, I haven't tried that. Oh, oh, I could eat them. With do you make them at home? Day. Uh huh. There's, um, them. there's someone in the NTA tribe that Tina Johnson, who's kind of a fermenting aficionado. And so she sure. gave me recently gave me some accessible, I say accessible, meaning like anyone can do them recipes. One was carrot. And so she's like, everyone likes carrot, mm. um, but she said, I'll have you fermenting in no time. So that's, that's one thing. So I'll have to, I'll have to talk with you about the fermented onions. I bet you that's delicious. For sure. For sure. And for anyone listening, who's wondering about that, there's um, uh, I'll link to a post where you can learn about how to ferment foods. It's really simple. You can do it at home. You really don't need much fancy equipment. Mm. Um, and you know, you can do a small batch. So if it doesn't work out, you didn't waste a bunch. And if it does work exactly. out, then there you go. <laughs> well, and then you feel empowered. I think that's the big yeah. thing is that for so many years, I didn't want a science experiment in my house. Yeah. Um, you know, and now knowing that it's a whole lot easier, even for me, I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can teach my clients to do this. It's not a big deal. So yeah. Yeah. It is good to know that there's, and I'll link to the blur, the brand that you mentioned, but it's good to know that you can find these elsewhere if you're yes. not ready to do it yourself. Absolutely. So we did get a, a question real quick since we're kind uh -huh. of on gut health. And I know um, we'll talk about this a little bit more as well. Um, so Rebecca is asking, can having an autoimmune disease make it harder to heal the gut? Well, we know if you have an autoimmune issue that at some point your gut has been leaky. So I think it's it's even more important that we work to establish a final, like what was the root cause of why that happened mm -hmm. um, and then work backwards. So no, it's not impossible but it's definitely something you want to work conscientiously towards because when you when you have leaky gut, and I don't know if anyone's spoken about this, so we know that no, you have these, these tight junctions have opened up. And so the foods that you're eating are then leaking into your bloodstream. So it's not a benign entity. I mean, I had leaky gut after being treated for Lyme disease. I developed psoriasis. Mm -hmm. um, I healed my gut. And then years later, I had, not, I had leaky gut again. So, you know, you can heal it and then it can, you know, it can reoccur. But obviously, I think it's really important if you've got an existing autoimmune disease that you really work conscientiously at strengthening the gut, working with someone that really understands gut physiology and, and a really a functional approach to addressing this. Because um, I find that I get a lot of referrals from other functional medicine providers who maybe have taken a crack at something that I then work on with a client. You just want to work mm. with someone that's really experienced with the autoimmune situation that you have um, and feels comfortable and confident that they can help you heal your gut as well. Because that's really, you know, once our gut is healed, I mean, we feel a whole lot better. Those cravings go away. Our energy is better. Our blood sugar is better regulated. Um, you know, we, we have a better mood. I mean, all those things are so, so important. Great mm -hmm. question. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that you do some testing with your clients. Mm -hmm. That's probably a scenario where it's going to be very helpful to do some yes. testing and see exactly what's going on. Exactly. And I, I pretty much don't take a client unless they're willing to go that direction, because I feel like it's just as important as the food and the supplement and the testing piece, because then we can make very targeted recommendations. We can do mm -hmm. a personalized elimination diet. We can find out exactly what's going on in the gut. Um, and there's, there's a test that I use called the GI map, um, that use DNA based technology. I, I think it is the best gut test on the market by far without exception. I don't think there's anything else that comes close. I sing it from the rafters. Like I've been working with it for about 18 months. Um, and I end up doing it on almost all of my clients because they've mm. had other testing done. And when it's a culture based medium, you just don't get the same information. And I, 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 I'm kind of a snob about testing. I mean, I think it's, it's really very beneficial when it's used when it's used properly. That's what I would yeah. say. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to meld your backgrounds as well, mm -hmm. the Western medicine training and yeah. the functional approach so that yeah. you're um, making these functional holistic recommendations mm -hmm. for specific reasons based Correct. on these tests that you're seeing. I think that's really Correct. important. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. 
So in your experience, about how long does it take for someone to heal their gut? And like, what are the signs that they're even on the right track if they're feeling like this is taking forever? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I think that's always a trick question. Um, well, there's so many factors as to what, what what was the gut insult. When I do a very thorough evaluation, when someone comes on board, I'm like, when did you notice your health change? Well, some people, it could be 10 years ago, three years yeah. ago, five years ago. Um, it depends on how deep we dig and how committed they are to doing the work because it's not easy. I'll be completely honest with you. It took me three years for me to get back to where I was. Um, and that was with me being very conscientious. And I tell my clients, this is not going to be a six month process. This is going to be a year, two years, potentially three years if we get it right. So you have to work with someone who works with people that are struggling with the same issues you have. Um, you need to stay the course. You need to have faith. You have to, you know, I use the term surrender, but that's what I had to do with my own practitioners that, um, I just had to stop, you know, it's, it's my mindset as a nurse practitioner. I want to ask a hundred questions. I want to be thinking ahead. And I finally just said, no, I'm just going to surrender. They have my best interest at heart. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to act like a patient and shut my mouth and mm. ask questions when I want to. So to answer your question, which you originally asked about, um, the average person, it's a year or two. I don't think it's, it's not designed to be fast. I mean, you really have to dig deep to find out what, what's the root cause of why their gut, gut integrity has been compromised. And oftentimes it's not just a one size fits all approach. There's not one client I've worked with that I can say I've had the same approach with every other person. It is not that way. And the other piece is sometimes people compromise their own healing because it's hard. Um, you have to choose to do the work. You have to choose to want to get better. You have to choose to sometimes make choices that aren't fun to do. Um, I am glue. I'll give you an example. I'm gluten grains and dairy free. I'm a lot of fun to go out with. Right. Um, but I just choose because I feel so good that I'm like, I'm going to make the best of it. I'm going to have protein and veggies. I'm totally cool with that. It is not a big deal, but other people are like, Oh my God, I feel so bad for you. I'm like, I don't feel bad for me. I feel good. Like my body's happy and healthy. And so I say the same thing with my clients. It is a choice. You are choosing to make these changes because you want to get better. It's all that mindset piece. So I, I've come to find the mindset is almost more important than any other work that we do. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of weave that in with my clients. Some obviously need more support in that area than others, but um, that would be my, my canned response. I, I think that's my honest response. It's not meant to be a race. It's meant to be a journey. Yeah, I think that's great you know, just to remind people that it, it is a process and, mm -hmm. you know, nutrition and health is not um, a mountain that you climb and then you're at the top and that's it. And for the rest of your life, you're, you know, you've won. Um, it's an ongoing process. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what are some of your favorite foods for healing the gut? Hmm. Um, you know, I would say probably a combination of like prebiotic rich foods. So mm -hmm. things like tiger nut, flour or nuts, um, asparagus, which is probably my favorite vegetable. So that's easy. Um, you know, I like probiotic rich foods because that's a real thing that people can consume. Um, you know, I think that it's a good question. Um, it's so personalized. I mean, that's the problem. Like I used to think, oh, everyone needs X or everyone needs this supplement to help heal their gut. But I think it's more the mindset piece. It goes back mm -hmm. to, you know, really working on that stress body connection um, and recognizing that's super important. But I would see pre and probiotic rich foods are certainly very beneficial. Um, lots of vegetables, um, you know, low sugar fruits, good, good clean protein, um, you know, wild caught fish, grass, you know, grass fed beef, those kinds of things because there's a lot that I pull out. Like when I'm really working to heal the gut, a lot of the inflammatory foods are gone. So gluten, grains, dairy, alcohol, sugar, uh, everyone's probably thinking that's the worst answer ever, but really personalized <laughs> to, the, to the client. Honestly, that's the honest answer is that we really yeah. fine tune the diet and dial in on, you know, what is most nourishing, what is going to be easiest for their body to break down. And that's when you really just get to the basics um, and, and kind of go from there. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up both sides because it's, it's, you know, you can add in a lot of foods, but you also have to remove those inflammatory mm -hmm. foods and, you know, take out those stressors and then add in the healers. So you've mm -hmm. got both of those things happening. Absolutely. And a lot of those probiotic rich foods can sometimes be a lot for our bodies to manage. I'm in the mm -hmm. midst of a restorative protocol right now. And, and a lot of the probiotic probiotic supplements 
whoo, they're not easy to manage. Um, and that's even with a fairly healthy gut. Uh, so that's why I'm hesitant to say like, I want to use this product because yeah. I know even for myself, I just keep going back to the foods. What, how many probiotic and prebiotic rich foods can I be consuming so that I know they're, they're helping to, you know, kind of reinstitute that good back, good gut bacteria, mm -hmm. um, but manage the side effects because what can happen if anyone's wondering what I'm referring to, um, a lot of those prebiotic foods can sometimes create some gas. And so you can then deal with bloating. And um, so I would say you have to go low and slow. That's always my approach, low and slow, a little bit every day, every, you know, every bit certainly adds up uh, in, a, in a positive light. So mm -hmm. Balance yeah. is king. If balance is elusive, but balance is, is what you're aiming for. Yeah, absolutely. And building those habits, getting the habit of mm -hmm. some good fermented foods every day, even a little bit at a time. Yep. And that's great. Makes and also difference. sauerkraut and asparagus is a delicious combination. So yes. there we go. Yep. Now I, I, I literally will pull out a container have a couple bites. I mean, my kids know they think it's funny. They think it's, I'm crazy, but that's okay. They're teenagers <laughs> now. So if they think their mom is crazy, if that's the worst they think that I'm crazy with, then that's fine. I can accept that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, um, while we're on the topic, this is kind of a side thing, but something I tried recently was mm -hmm. making a um, salad dressing. And instead of using vinegar in the dressing, using brine from sauerkraut oh, or yum. ferment. That sounds it's awesome. delicious. It really that added an awesome. extra depth of flavor and um, oh, the like, idea. Like mommy kind of flavor. I bet you that mm -hmm. was wonderful. Yeah. It's funny. I was having a conversation about using MCT oil as part of a dressing with a client today. And so it was funny. As soon as you said that, I was like, if you say MCT oil, that's going to make me giggle. <laughs> but all those things, you know, trying to integrate, you know, some of those healthy foods and to sneak them in. So maybe someone doesn't know that they're eating them. It's all good. Yeah. But I'll have to think about that next time with the olives. That's great. Yeah. We'll have to put together a, a recipe of some mm -hmm. MCT oil and uh, uh, ferment brine. Yes. Yeah, so you just have to be careful. For anyone who doesn't know, MCT oil is wonderful. Medium chain triglyceride process a little more easily by the body. Mm -hmm. So almost get a free pass. Uh, the issue is some people or their bodies are a little sensitive to it. And so mm -hmm. yeah, a little bit goes a long way. So I always remind clients that you start slowly um, because you don't want to have the dreaded, <laughs> I giggle every time I say it, um, disaster pants. Ah, yep. You don't want that yep. at all. Okay, good to know. So for anyone mm -hmm. who is watching, uh, if you want to make this salad dressing, we're not doing... <laughs> the yes, amount of uh, yes. MCT oil that you're not just swapping out olive oil. If you're, if you're a virgin MCT person, go slowly. That's what, that's my, you know, their, their Bulletproof makes a really good quality MCT oil that I use. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I, I am a realist. So I have actually have Bulletproof bars when I travel because sometimes I get stuck with all my food peculiarities. And I made the mistake when we were traveling overseas, I had two in one day and um, mm. it was, yeah. So I, I just mentioned that as like a public service announcement announcement. One is fine. Don't ever have two. Um, that would, I'll just leave it at that. And I wasn't in a situation where that was at all fun. So. I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, but thank you for the lesson that we can all learn from. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for You're this, welcome. all of your knowledge and sharing your expertise. Um, I'm really glad that we did get to have a conversation about gut health and digestion because um, it, it has been a running theme throughout the whole summit. And so I think this is great to be able to kind of end this whole summit on it. It all comes back to the gut. You know, if you have a hormonal issue, something that seems so unrelated, but it, it really all comes back to the gut. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to yeah. uh, be part of the summit and, you know, gut health is something I talk about every day. It doesn't matter who I'm talking to. It's always tangentially part of my discussion. So happy to, <laughs> to chat about it. So before I let you go, um, since Halloween is coming up and that's mm -hmm. a holiday all about sugar and candy yep. and the things we're trying to help people um, not eat, do you have a little tip or trick that you can share to help everyone have a healthier Halloween this year? Yes. So what I would say is this, enjoy a piece or two of candy and then donate the rest. However, here's the other piece. Um, or, you know, buy yourself some good quality, quality dark chocolate and just mm. enjoy it. 
Um, but make sure if you're going to a party or you're going out trick or treating with your kids, eat before you go. So you're not mm. likely to like dive into their, their Halloween bags. I mean, I know my husband has a thing for Snickers bars. It's probably the only time in the entire year he eats one, but he usually goes overboard and then he feels crummy. So make sure you've eaten. If you indulge, you have a couple pieces, don't eat the rest, get it out of your house. So it's not so tempting. Um, I know for myself, I, for a few years, I used to buy candy I didn't like so that I wouldn't be tempted. Now I buy, now I buy whatever. And then I donate everything like the next day to the soldiers who probably don't need the candy either, but um, at least I feel like I'm doing something, something good. So, and no guilt. Here's the other thing. I don't like people feeling guilty. I don't like people saying it was good or bad or that, that whole negative mindset. I'm like, strike it from your, from your vocabulary. If you overindulge tomorrow's another day, again, get rid of the candy. So though it is removed from your house, so you cannot make that same decision for yourself the following day. Mm -hmm. It is not an excuse to eat from October 31st till January 1st, eat like garbage. You know, you, yeah. you want to head into the holidays and not feel like you're, um, you're encumbered by like sugar cravings that are calling to you in the, in the dead of night. So enjoy, let it go. Enjoy it. That's my, my takeaway. Absolutely. I love that. And um, uh, thank you. Your information you, has been very helpful. Awesome. awesome. All right. Thank you so much for this. Um, so I will edit the video for anyone watching and add in links um, to everything that we talked about, some of the resources that you mentioned. And do you want to just share with everyone where can they find you um, to connect further? Yeah, no. So I'm all over social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram and I'm also on Facebook. And so it's CHT Wellness. And then my website is www.chtwellness.com. And I am just getting ready to launch a program that is going to be essentially a little hormone reset for the holidays. I don't normally do this, but I felt I feel like there are a lot of people coming to me right now who really need that. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm just, I'm working with my team. We're getting ready to get something out. So there should be some information coming shortly. And I also have a, um, a private Facebook group called CHT wellness community that I would love for women to be a part of. I post great content and I generally jump in on Fridays and answer questions. So whatever content has been people have been commenting all week, I'll usually jump in on Fridays and do a live video. Awesome. Well, tomorrow is Friday. So everyone yep. joined the group today get familiar with the content and then <laughs> chat with Cynthia tomorrow. Sounds good. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank thanks you. everybody. Talk Thank to you, you soon. Bye.